Uh, good morning. It's Tuesday, April 5th, 2022. It's uh, um, two minutes of 10 a.m. And we are uh, resuming Senate Natural Resources Energy's work on the Clean Heat Standard Bill S15. Sorry, H715, an act relating to the Clean Heat Standard. And in that bill, there is a large role to be played by the PUC and creating and organizing, uh, architecting the, the program. And so wanted to hear from you folks directly since there's an awful lot of uh, language that lands right squarely in your shop. And we'd love to hear your thoughts on the bill generally and uh, any thoughts you have on possible uh, suggestions, edits, clarifications, wh whatever you would like, we want to cover. We we gain for hearing. Senator Weston and staffing and staffing, right? And just so that you know, let's go around the table, starting with Senator Campion, and introduce ourselves. Sure, uh, Brian Campion from Bank County. Senator, thanks. Mark McDonald, Orange County. Right. Welcome. Good morning, Chris Bray from Madison County. Uh, Rich Westman from Wilmington. McCormick from the Windsor County District. Yeah, you're from my district. Where are you? I live in Butter Street. Yeah. Okay. So, again, um, thanks for coming over to this morning, Chair Reisman. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting us. And as you pointed out, uh, there are a number of roles that are identified uh, in this uh, legislation for the PUC to carry out. Uh, to help answer your questions, which is what we're here to primarily do, is answer your questions. Uh, I have uh, my general counsel, uh, Kyle Landis Marinello, who's with me, and our policy director, uh, uh, Tom Nauer, who is available remotely. And I assume that you all can see him where I'm sitting. I can't, but that's right. <laughs> Morning. You have a guardian angel right over your shoulder. Oh, there. that's good. That's good. Yes. Well, when I, I noticed when I was looking at this uh, at the hearings, you can see everybody but the person who speaks. Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, so I made sure that I covered my balls. <laughs> <laughs> we've we've heard that comment before from other people. Who didn't really like the camera angle. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. As I said, our purpose is to answer questions. Uh, and um, we will not address any merits questions sure. because ultimately under this legislation, it would be our job to uh, resolve those kinds of questions. And I think uh, the main message that I wanted us to deliver to you today is that we are very well equipped to do that. Uh, this is this is what we do. Uh, we are not a policy making body. We are a policy implementing body. Uh, you, the legislature, set the policies. We let the parties come to us and tell us what they think is the right way to carry out those policies. And we've done it on numerous occasions before. And uh, we have an amazing staff of people, 15 hearing officers who have legal experience, economic experience, uh, energy experience, environmental experience. And so we believe that uh, the task is one, <clears throat> excuse me, that we can carry out effectively. Uh, Tom will discuss in more detail the aspects of the legislation that really are similar, <clears throat> excuse me, similar to things that we have done ourselves before. The legislation is focused on how to implement a policy that is rep represents the distillation of many years of thinking by the legislature and stakeholders in the state as to how we should approach making it possible to have a carbon reduction in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the heating sector that uh, reflects the fact that the heating sector is a major contributor 
to carbon and without addressing it, the problem of getting our carbon down to the levels that the state has set is not possible. Uh, Tom will discuss in detail, as I explained, how these tasks are similar to the past. Kyle will talk more about the legality. Is this, is this bill legally workable? And is it legal? Does it in some way or another fail to recognize the unique roles of the legislature and an independent regulatory agency like the PBC? So with uh, those things in mind, uh, I think one, I'll pause to see if you have any questions for me, and then Tom and Kyle can speak. Sure. Um, I think that, you know, the, the biggest question I've had people sort of float out to me is, well, the PUC has a long tradition of, of implementing programs delivered to regulated utilities, and now it's going into unregulated fuels. Um, and is this, you know, some, is, is that sort of a, a natural task for them to take on, or, or is it, would it present unique challenges? Are we asking the right group to take on the task on behalf of government? And so I put that sort of open question to you. How have you thought about this? Well, I, I think I'd like to ask Tom to answer that initially, and then uh, I'll fill in if I think there's any broader uh, answer to do. So, Tom. Great. Thanks. Good morning, Mr. Mauer. Good morning. And for the record, Tom Maurer, uh, I, I work for Chair Roisman at the PUC. Um, so uh, as this committee already knows, um, the, the, this is an unregulated sector, uh, currently not within the PUC's jurisdiction. Um, so it's a natural question for you to ask. Um, I would say it's not, you know, a huge stretch in that uh, we have decades of experience of uh, implementing performance standards for sectors, um, whether that be the electric sector, uh, you know, the renewable energy standard is, is the perfect analogy, uh, where uh, lawmakers set up the policy saying we want our electric utilities to um, have, have more uh, renewable energy in their portfolios and increase that amount over time uh, by prescribed amounts. Um, you, you set up the, the policy direction, you set up um, kind of the guardrails, the, the specifics that were important to you, and then you handed it off to the PUC to say, figure this out, um, implement it, and um, oversee it for the next uh, period of time, 10, 12 years, I, for, I forget uh, what, what the ramp is. Um, so I think the clean heat standard represents an analogy there. It's a, it's a different sector of the Vermont economy, but the, the concept of setting up a performance standard um, with the policy direction from lawmakers and the implementation um, done by a state agency, um, the, bill, the bill looks to the PUC to be that state agency. And I would say um, the, the task that you're asking is similar to what we've done in the past. And, uh, and I just want to add to that that a big part of this legislation, as with other similar legislation, is a process. Make sure that everybody that has something to say has a chance to say it, and make sure that that voice is effectively integrated into what the final decision is. And we do this all the time. Uh, we do it in, in minor things like the siting of a project, solar or a wind turbine, but we also do it on the policy level. We do rulemakings, we do investigations, we do reports for the legislature. So we have a lot of experience with how to make sure that all the stakeholders are participating, draw out from them. Sometimes you have to do that, draw out from them the information that they have. And I think you've seen a little bit of that in your own hearings. You've heard from a variety of different entities with different points of view about 
potential problems if you implement it this way rather than that way. And we're used to that. And we are used to trying to reconcile that so that everybody at the end of the day has a fair chance to be heard and their point of view is integrated into the final decision. So, uh, so process-wise, I think we're we're well equipped to do that as well. I certainly, um, yeah, I appreciated how rich the record was that you developed on the recent global warming GMP um, hearings. You know, the docket to have a uh, a new a new form of utility created. So. I was on the email list, and there was a lot of a lot of discussions on that. So, um, thanks for that. Um, another question that has come up, so <clears throat> was related to the uh, delegation. Uh, you know, when we delegate uh, authority, we we're, we have to provide adequate direction. So I just want to check in from your perspective if you find that the bill is crafted in such a way as to provide enough guidance that you feel as though it's um, uh, adequately well defined so you're not left with um, large open questions that are really policy matters that ought to be decided by the legislature in advance of asking you to work on behalf of fellow Vermonters. Yeah, I'm going to ask our general counsel, Kyle, to answer that question. Okay. Sure. Um, Kyle Landis Marinello, general counsel of the Public Utility Commission. So, yeah, with any legislation, there's a balancing act of, as you said, Chairman, giving enough direction that we know what the policy is, we know uh, how to implement it, but also leaving some leeway for the practical things that can't be envisioned right now, but will come out with a more thorough stakeholder engagement and process um, and i think that one of the most important things with this bill is that it does spell out what the reductions need to be it says you need to meet the requirements of the global warming solutions act and you need to meet the thermal sectors portion of that and so that's key language in terms of setting out what the standard is for us to implement and that's a policy choice appropriate for the, the legislature to make. Um, in terms of the implementation, I think that we do have enough guidance. I actually think there's one section where the House version provided a little too much fine detail, and that's in, in section three on the implementation. Um, and it, in short, there are a lot of very specific directions given to the commission in terms of the stakeholder engagement. And when I see something like that, it does raise concerns for me about the implementation side. And uh, I think one example is um, we're required to give notice of any workshops on our website. That's uh, we, we do that anyways, but also directly to a, a number of groups. And some of those are well defined, like the Department of Public Service, and we would absolutely give them notice also. But there are other groups in that list. For instance, one of them says renewable energy advocates. And as the attorney looking at something like that, and I'm working with our clerk about who do we send this notice out to, I don't know how to interpret a phrase like that, whether it means renewable energy for Vermont, clearly that would be an organization that would get notice but renewable energy advocates could include individual Vermonters sure. that self-identify that way. And so, and there's just other terms throughout there that we're required to give notice to. And so I, I raised this with um, Ms. Tchaikovsky that I think in section three, it would be helpful to change some of those shells to may or make best efforts and to for the notice provisions to require maybe publication on our website and publication in newspapers through press releases. And uh, we have a process set up for doing that. And, and I want to be clear, we want anyone and everyone to get notice of this. We want to send it out as broadly as possible, get as much engagement as possible. We just don't want to get caught three years from now, we're right. starting to implement this and someone goes to court and says, 
I was supposed to get notice and I get in, so I wanted to flag that as a place that could use some changes. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, for that change and any others, things of concern, if you can um, put them in writing and send it to the committee as well as to Mr. Kowski, that'd be great. Um, are they are most of the changes you have of that nature? I mean, not um, substantial rewrites, but more uh, edits in order to uh, improve clarity or something like that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, another question that's come up as people have thought about the bill is the notion of uh, should we be sending the bill over and then you're working for a period of two plus years, you know, to stand up the program and get it going. Um, should the legislature have to have some sort of affirmative vote somewhere along that path to say continue to work? And um, I think the concern I, one, I'm not aware there being precedent to ask for a new program to be established and then actually have a hard vote requirement in the middle of the process. So I don't know if in your experience at the PUC you've ever had sort of a check vote or whatever it gets called like that. Um, but the other thing is I'm not sure how that would work process wise if you would have to sort of there's a, a lot to do in this bill, and then I'm guessing, although two and a half years is a long time, that you have to make pretty steady progress all the way through that time period to meet those timelines. And I don't know what any kind of stop to uh, it seem like you would have to sort of stop construction in order to wait for the the owner to sign the next check to continue construction. That, that doesn't sound like a good way to set up a process, but I wanted to hear your thoughts on that one, if you've given it any consideration. Well, frankly, that, that's the first I've heard of that sort of stop approach. Um, I do think everything you said, it does make it difficult to do the process with those kinds mm -hmm. of stops taking place. I also think it can diminish the quality of the information that we receive. I mean, the truth is, at the end of the day, in anything like this, all the stakeholders are going to have to decide where to make the compromises. They will have to make decisions. I think we could live with this, but we really can't live with that. And it, it's a kind of internal negotiation. And deadlines and certainty that certain things are going to happen are what drive those choices. And as long as we have a process with a, with a deadline that says you must do certain things by a certain date, and there are no sort of intermediate steps where people can come in, people are going to be more encouraged to tell us this is really my bottom line. And I think you're more likely to think creatively. How can I really get what I need to achieve my goal without running afoul of somebody else's goal? So uh, I, I think the, the, the process that the bill now contemplates is more likely to produce an effective product than it would if there were some kind of an interim step where everybody could say, well, I'm going to hold my fire until I see if I get a better outcome at the interim step level. Um, and it, it's, if, if you've ever bought a house, probably everybody has, and someone says, well, what are you willing to pay for the house? You start off with a nice low number. And you don't really know what you're going to be willing to pay for the house until the broker finally says to you, look, the seller is not going to go under this number. And then for the first time, you decide, well, maybe I'll pay that because I really want the house. So this bill helps with the deadlines that are in the bill to create those moments of truth. And uh, I, I would say we're keeping them just as they are. Uh, Senator McDonald. <clears throat> oh, I remember the uh, 
saying the last resort of the would be referee is the do over. I think that's just what the witness was talking about. But I, um, the PUC has spent its life immersed in electricity and occasionally brushed up against uh, nuclear power. Um, it strikes me that we're putting together an organization to, to run a Navy that was raised and uh, read and trained in the Air Force. Um, how do you respond to that? Well, first, to, to start with the analogy, actually, I served in both the Army and the Navy. <laughs> so, so it is possible to, uh, to do both more, more seriously. We have had experience with the concepts that this legislation is asking us to address. The particular industry, we have not had experience with. And the stakeholder process that this bill creates, not only what we're supposed to do, but their advisory committees, and tags, and others who are putting input into it, will ensure that what we don't know that's unique about the, the fuel industry, which, as, as you point out, we have not had experience with, will give us the information. We're still putting it, we're still putting it into the same kind of process. How do you protect the economic interests of this group? How do you achieve the, the environmental goals of that group? So it's it is a different type of information, but it's not a different type of process for addressing that information. And I was pleased to see that in the hearings that you've had, you've already had information presented to you by different groups telling you where they think an interest that they have needs to be addressed in the final solution of the, of the bill. And uh, that's the kind of input that we would, that we would rely on. Um, you'll remember back in the day, uh, Vermont led the nation in creating the first uh, uh, energy efficiency utility. And frankly, the PUC of that day hadn't had experience with regulating or even creating an energy efficiency utility. But I think the results have proven the capability of this organization and the way it's structured, the PUC and it was the Public Service Board, being able to take on a task and apply it. And we're still talking about energy. I mean, if this, if this were a bill that said, we want you to set up a fine arts council for the state of Vermont. That would be something outside our wheelhouse. This is energy, and uh, and at least one fuel, natural gas, is one that we already regulate. So the the regulations here are not as as remote from our experience. But uh, Tom may have some additional thoughts on this, Tom. Sure. Um, I, I agree with the, the premise of the question that is, you know, again, this is a, this is a sector uh, that we have not traditionally had jurisdiction over. Um, and I, I was going to mention the energy efficiency utility, uh, but Chair Roisman has already covered that. And I would say uh, with establishing the renewable energy standard, um, the commission has, um, again, uh, that was a, a brand new role where uh, lawmakers told us to set up a program where our electric utilities would have a new responsibility in the unregulated fuel sector under tier three. You know, the, the direction there is reduce customers' fossil fuel consumption. Uh, that was like, you know, a first in the nation um, approach and we had to learn on the fly. And uh, similar to what's being asked in this bill, um, we had robust stakeholder process to to develop um, the rules uh, that, that would govern the, the tier three program. Um, sim similar to the res, similar to energy efficiency, we're, we're, the clean heat standard is a performance standard. Um, so it's, it's a lot of accounting um, and the, the PUC um, 
has experience setting up performance standards where really we, we are performing an, an accounting function um, and making sure that the obligated entities are doing what, what lawmakers have directed. Uh, thank you. You know, sometimes I think of bills as blueprints that the legislature can think they've done the job by writing the blueprint, but then you have to actually build the building. And I don't think I've ever participated in any kind of construction project where the blueprint answered all the questions. You know, you still you have to do it the work to figure things out and encounter the problem. So I'm it seems appropriate to me that there's a framework, but not every answer at the end or an attempt at every answer. How about um, another thing I've had heard some ones like channeling concerns that get presented to me, so I can hear your thoughts on is uh, the role of ANR for so I noticed on the on the tag, the technical advisor group, the, the Department of Environmental Conservation is a member of the tag and um, do you have any thoughts about the role of ANR in the bill? Like, uh, basically, are they called upon to play, you know, a role in the bill in the places where you would want their expertise to such a degree that you feel like you've got the, your bases covered in terms of could could be uh, you know, air uh, greenhouse gas and science, you know, that side of things, emission science. Well, first, we really rely on ANR for its expertise in everything that we do now. Uh, they are frequently a party uh, in our cases, particularly as you would expect in citing cases. Um, I think the bill now sets up an opportunity for them to participate uh, extensively. Uh, my experience is they're not shy if they thought there was something more that they needed to say if it didn't explicitly give them uh, the, the, the microphone under the bill, we would we would hear from them. But they may wish to have the, the language that describes their role modified in some way. And I assume, I, I know you had uh, uh, Mr. McNamara here to testify. He, he didn't speak to that particular question, but um, I'm sure if they thought that portion of the bill needed to either increase the, their participation or modify the way it was expressed, I'm sure you'll hear from that. Our goal would be to get all the information that they could possibly provide to us into our record because they, they are, as you say, on, on some of these issues, they are the state's experts. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, and one last question for me is related to, some people have uh, expressed some concerns over constitutional issues around commerce laws and the point of regula regulation. And um, I don't know if, as you've envisioned taking this on, if Mr. Dennis Marnello or others, if you've had any conversations about um, what you think its legal status would be if the bill as designed currently were to move forward. Are you comfortable with its, um, you know, any kind of constitutional implications? Well, as you point out, uh, we, we happen to have maybe the state's expert on the dormant clause in the PUC uh, as Kyle. Uh, I have to confess that when I first heard the phrase, I thought dormant was a good word to use because I got very sleepy. Uh, <laughs> but Kyle can explain. No offense to Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to let Kyle answer this one. Yeah. But I think I remember when you referred to as an expert in it, when you referred to it as a dormant commerce clause, nerd. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I, I will say, I mean, this is an issue that it's really for legislative counsel and in consultation with the Attorney General's office to be looking at. I do know they've looked closely at that issue. Um, and I, I was brought into that conversation at times as well. And I think the way that it's been drafted now is done in a a careful way and uh, being mindful and making sure that um, they're staying within the, the bounds of what's allowed. Okay. Um, and we are, just so you know, we're asking Mr. Hand and 
Ms. Murphy from the AG's office and you know, to touch base with that director, uh, Senator Kim. So would you mind just talking for a minute about the dormant commerce clause to the committee? Because my understanding, it has something to, it, it's what can be done more out of state than in state. Is that accurate? I mean, we've been dealing with it a little bit down the hall in another committee around what, you know, if, if you're closing certain things off, if you're letting some things go out of state, but not to all states, it's the way we've been sort of dealing with it. And I don't know if you would just give us your take on it. Sure. I, I mean, it can come up in a number of contexts. Sure. I think that uh, really big picture, what courts tend to be looking for is whether there's some sort of discrimination against out-of-state economic interests in a way that gives preference to in-state economic interests. And so a classic example would be if you were trying to uh, put the cost of something entirely on out-of-state interest and uh, get the benefits all in-state. And so um, there are other aspects. There's a extraterritoriality principle, which is related to just the general jurisdictional question that the Vermont legislature has authority over what happens within the state of Vermont, um, but uh, there are limits on um, what can be said about what happens outside Vermont borders. And so I think that's why there, there is language here to be clear what's happening is it's when the, the fuel enters Vermont, the first point of sale that um, there's clear jurisdiction at that point, and uh, that's a place where this requirement can be imposed on those obligated entities. Thank you. So for the two kind of situations that I've heard people talk about, or, or three, one, if a fuel dealer buys in fuel directly from out of state, then, then that the purchase is at the fuel dealers in state, that's the, the point of obligation. Is that correct? I'm sorry, can you say that again? So there's a Vermont fuel dealer. Mm -hmm. They buy from a wholesaler outside of state. As they, when they make that purchase, they inherit the obligation because the first point of sale is who, which side of that transaction has the obligation? The purchaser yes. who brings it into Vermont or the wholesaler mm -hmm. outside of Vermont who sold it in? If, in that situation, as I read this bill, it's the wholesaler who's selling it into the state there who's taking on that obligation. Okay. And another sort of curveball was, well, what if there's a fuel dealer across the river in New Hampshire, they come over to sell in Vermont. Um, so the point of purchase becomes, in that case, the customer's home. And is that when the fuel dealer then has an obligation at that point? Yes, as I understand, that's when you'd be capturing retail sales is if a fuel dealer in New Hampshire, for instance, delivers uh, and the first point of sale is at the retail level in Vermont, it's that New Hampshire based fuel dealer that incurs the obligation. Okay. Right. So, uh, thank you. Um, well, it's been very helpful. I, so, I don't know if you, uh, if Chair Weisman or Mr. Nauer, Mr. Linsmanow, is there anything we didn't ask about that you feel is sort of on your mind that you'd like to share with us before we move on? Senator Weston. Um, have you looked at the staffing levels in the bill and um, what it takes to accomplish it? And can you just make a comment on that? Sure. I'm, I'm going to ask, this work will be supervised by uh, Mr. Nauer as our policy director, uh, and he would he would be the one to answer this question. So, uh, Tom, you're on. Great. So, uh, yes, we believe that the three additional staff, two of those are permanent positions. One is a limited service position. Uh, we believe that is sufficient um, to set up the program, um, and. I base that on my experience um, when lawmakers passed the renewable energy standard and directed us to set up that that program. There were about three or four of us who were regularly involved um, for the the first year or year or two when we were setting up the program. Um, first through stakeholder process, leading to a commission order, 
and then uh, the rulemaking followed that. Um, so we, we had more staff involvement up front, and then once the rule was in place and the utilities were implementing it and we had gained some experience with kind of the, the cadence of how things worked, um, it's required less staff oversight um, as time has gone on. And so I think the, the staffing level that's in the bill reflects that. We'll need three, three people dedicated to this. And I, I strongly suspect that there will be other staff currently at the PUC who will be involved. Um, but once everything is set up and in place and um, we've got the first year or so of implementation, um, that's why you see that limited service position dropping off. Um, the, that 600,000 that goes to um, the PUC and similar amount to the Department of Public Service, you also have to hire consultants. So does that, the 600 uh, provide adequate funding for the consultant that you'll also need to be hiring in? Um, well, so that the, the 600,000 estimate was provided to the House committee early on in the bill. Um, and it, it's hard to say what the final number is. You know, we, we don't have experience hiring, you know, a public engagement consultant. So I, I'm not sure what that cost will be. Uh, the, the figure that was proposed for the technical advisory group consultant was based on similar scopes of work that, that we've received bids on in the past. Um, so we feel pretty good about that. The, the money that uh, would be there for the staff positions feel pretty confident of that. It, it's, I would say it's impossible for us to say what's the, the bottom line for the first year of implementation. Um, just that's, that's uncertain. So we've said we can live with the 600,000. It'll probably go over. Um, I, I, just, think, I, I just want to add one thing to what Tom said. As you probably know, the, the, through good management, my predecessor, we have a reserve and uh, <clears throat> we don't use it for routine expenses, but we do use it for extraordinary expenses. So if it turned out that in order to fully staff the implementation of this legislation, 600,000 was not enough, uh, we would simply uh, go to our reserves and make up the difference. So we're, we're not suggesting that that number needs to be changed. We, we have the financial uh, uh, solidity to, to handle it if it, if it went up. Uh, Senator Watson, is there somewhere that we could get a breakdown? My afternoon committee's appropriations. The bill would have to go to appropriations. They're going to ask about positions, but the estimates are for each position, and they're going to ask for a breakdown. And and the other piece, as I understand it, um, most of this money is one-time money, and there are full-time positions, so there will be questions about that. Okay, we'll be happy to provide that. That we'll provide it to this committee, and if you want, we can separately provide it to appropriations. Uh, would you like us to do it that way? Well, as, as, um, in whatever form the bill moves, um, those will be the questions in appropriations okay. that will come up. So, all right, well, we'll, we'll be happy to provide that in a second. A little bit like your description of ANR not being shy, the appropriations committee won't be shy. Good. Yeah. 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 I'm a taxpayer too, so I'm glad we're doing that. When it will get there. Okay. Can I, can I uh, add something to that um, point? Uh, there, there was a fiscal note um, on this bill that, that looks at the appropriation. And, and so there's, there's details on wh what's the cost per position and what are the appropriations for the various consultants and advertising and the per diems for the members of, of the technical advisory group and the um, equity uh, group. Uh, so those, those details are available um, on, so, on this bill's website. There's a fiscal note and uh, yeah, go ahead. I, I just, the committee will ask for that and, and it's tradition that um, the joint fiscal committee would come in. The, 
the committee will want to hear from you too if it is the appropriate level. Sure. So we'll be glad to do whatever uh, you wish on that. Okay, great. Um, well, Senator McDowell? My first notes to myself were I wouldn't pick Picasso and Rembrandt to negotiate sculpture. So you brought up fine arts, but um, you're, you've talked about showing people showing their cards, reaching compromises, best offers and negotiations, et cetera, in a, um, in a medium that, um, that the PUC hasn't gotten into before. And I, in electricity in our history, it was always how to get the customer the best deal at, the, at a price that was reasonable in a regulated industry. Um, it wasn't um, a global warming thing until 20 years ago. This is global warming stuff. And we're putting you in charge. We would be putting you in charge of charting a course to reduce carbon. Um, and to the extent possible, compromises, best offers, and negotiations be damned. Um, it's a different, it's a, this is a different task that you're being assigned than what electricity used to be and has, has moved into. And why wouldn't we get people that were well-versed in carbon and fuels to, to do this rather than the PUC? Oh, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Let me see if I can give it at least a satisfactory answer. I think the legislature, after this many years of going through the question, has actually already answered those basic questions. They've already set for the state of Vermont how much carbon we need to take out of the system. And they've now decided how much of it needs to come from the unregulated fuel sector in this piece of legislation. So when I talk about compromises, that's already done. We already know where we have to get there. And what we will be doing under the legislation is deciding what is the best path to get from where we are there, given that we already know what there is. There is a certain reduction by 2025, 2030, 2050. And that kind of choice involves stakeholders themselves deciding what to do. For example, uh, Mr. Coden in his very uh, interesting testimony to the committee pointed out <clears throat> that already, 50% of the fuel dealers that he's aware of have started to now get into the heat pump business. If you think about it, that's, that's pretty extraordinary. It's like Vermont Gas telling you that they're going to get rid of all their carbon by 2050. The, uh, uh, an electric company telling you that they're going to work to reduce the amount of the product that they're going to sell to people. I mean, imagine this in the, in the typical commercial. A grocery store opens its door and says, our business is to make sure you buy as few groceries as possible. Uh, so it's a fairly extraordinary thing and it's already happened. So I have a lot of faith in, in what I call the Vermont spirit, the ability of a Vermonter who figures out that he's gonna use his truck in the summer to haul grain and to put a snowplow on it in the winter and keep the truck going. The fuel dealers have already figured out it's going to be good for us to be in two different businesses that are technically in competition with each other. We're going to help you as our customer buy less of our fuel and more of our heat pumps. So I think when I talk about compromises, Senator, what I'm talking about is all of these stakeholders recognizing how things are going to have to change because we already know the goal. We can't get to 2030 and not meet the carbon reduction goal. 
we have to get to. So the task we have is to hear from everybody, what's the best way for you to participate in that process so that we all benefit, because we all will suffer. Uh, you know, the, the next mud season, like this mud season, will remind us that things have changed um, and we need to be uh, addressing it. So I, I think what we have here in this bill is a process to help us get to the goals that have been set by the legislature. Um, last question, Senator McCormick, because we have um, an next witness with hard stuff. Uh, keeping with, with your analysis, the goal, though, is that eventually these sellers of, carbon, of fossil fuels will stop selling fossil fuels altogether. And we need to get, ultimately, we want to have to not be contributing any more greenhouse gases. Um, so what I look at as a model, and I just ask you to com comment on it, is I was surprised at the holdings of Liggett and Meyer, of how much Liggett and Meyer corporate owns that has nothing to do with tobacco. The sense being that they've read the writing on the wall and that they're not necessarily in the tobacco business, they're in the selling of stuff business. <laughs> and so they're selling other stuff. And that the same thing with, with the, the, the sellers of fossil fuel will be in the business of selling other forms of energy. I suppose there are some people who will do that because besides being business people, they're citizens and they recognize this is what we have to do. I also presume there are some who are reluctant and who regard this as a bit of an intrusion on their business life. And that there, what they need is what Ligon Meyer said, which was strong external pressure. And that's where the government comes in. We're, we're saying basically, I know you don't want to do this, but you're going to have to do it anyway. Which is sometimes what the government does. That would fall to you, the sellers of fossil fuels. Would it not? Well, and yeah. Okay, and the question is, you know, I guess two questions. Are you able to do that? And are you happy about doing that? Is it something that do, do you have do you bring enthusiasm to that fact? We're really not interested in the latter though. <laughs> no, I mean the yeah, the, the one that mentions happiness. <laughs> well, uh, people do a better job when they like the job they're doing. That's true. Okay. Well, uh, let let me say this that in, in some ways. Uh, maybe thankfully, uh, the legislature has already taken step one. You've already sent out the message that we've got to get the carbon out of our environment. Uh, and uh, you did that on efficiency, and uh, Vermont uh, has done an extraordinary job of reducing uh, the amount of electricity that people used to do the very same thing that they were doing before. Um, I think that now it will be a pressure that's put on by the legislation. It's a pressure that tries to internalize the external cost of a certain kind of activity. We're not in the business of eliminating the use of fuels as a way to generate electricity. It's what comes out of those fuels. So the bill encourages biofuels. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned before, Vermont Gas intends to stay in the gas business, but to use renewable gas to meet its obligations along with energy efficiency, along with encouraging weatherization, along with helping to support people actually switching to non-gas heating uh, with gas and only with tobacco. As to the happiness question, I don't know whether I use the word happiness. I think that the Public Utility Commission as an entity uh, believes in the goals of the legislature uh, and the state has set uh, because we're citizens and we're affected. Every single person is affected by the next horrific storm or the flood 
or the failure to get enough snow in the winter uh, or to get too much rain in the, in the spring. Uh, so yes, we're, we are very glad to be able to be part of the process. Thank you so much for coming in. Yes, thank you. See you again. And thanks to you and your team for um, pitching in this morning. If we have follow-up questions, we'll, we'll of course reach back out. And Mr. Farnell, if you can follow up with us on the uh, edits that you uh, found for the bills, that will be helpful. Thank you. Thanks, I'll do that. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank, you. thank, you. thank, thank you very much for, for all your questions. And please stay in touch if you can answer any other questions. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I'd like to uh, say, uh, say yes. hello to a uh, old friend of this committee who I haven't seen for a little while. Good morning, Ms. Foster. Good to see you again. And uh, I know you have a hard stop, so let's jump right in. I do. Thank you for having me here today. Can you hear me okay and see the slides that I'm sharing? Yes, thanks. Wonderful. Um, so as I mentioned, um, Rebecca Foster, the Interim Managing Director of Efficiency Vermont, and I'm here today, um, unfortunately, with a hard stop at 11 um, to share a little bit of Efficiency Vermont's perspective about the clean heat standard. My colleague, Dan Riley, is in the committee room with you today, and I'll keep my remarks brief. I'm happy to come back and answer questions if the committee has any for me um, tomorrow or, or further along as you take testimony on this bill. And well, thank you for your flexibility and sorry that we're quite so tight here. Fine. Um, so moving forward, I think I'll skip the Efficiency Vermont slide. Many of you know Efficiency Vermont well. And I'll just move to uh, this slide, which introduces the key points that I'll be making in my remarks today. First uh, and foremost, Efficiency Vermont is supportive of the clean heat standard. Uh, we believe that it will deliver the most benefits if it increases weatherization and fuel switching projects that are done in the state. Um, and then third, as you'll hear me describe, the bill as currently written will most likely result in fuel switching to biofuels, but there is a change to the bill text that could be made to drive more weatherization projects. So I'm gonna walk you through each of these points. Um, and starting off, I'd like to just introduce the frame of societal benefits and customer benefits. Um, this is something that Efficiency Vermont thinks about quite often given uh, the majority of our work is, is operating in both of these two spheres. Um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions is a societal benefit. You know, that's something that we all benefit from, you know, across the state, across the country and across the world. And the thermal sector is an important focus of our work to reduce greenhouse gas emissions since it accounts for 34% of our emissions as a state. And as the committee works on policies to deliver societal benefits and reduce greenhouse gas emissions, Efficiency Vermont recommends that you also consider whether those policies will deliver customer benefits, namely cost savings. And this is important because the average Vermont family spends about 35% of their energy costs on heating. Efficiency Vermont believes that the clean heat standard will be most effective and most valuable for Vermonters if it delivers both societal and customer benefits. And it's important to think about both of these types of benefits because different projects that could be pursued to comply with a clean heat standard could provide different types of benefits. So I wanna just provide a comparison of weatherization and fuel switching. So from a societal perspective, you know, we know that both fuel switching and weatherization um, do reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So both are beneficial. From a customer perspective, though, there are some differences, and those are important differences. Uh, fuel switching alone, for example, may not reduce customer costs. But weatherization and fuel switching combined do reduce costs and provide significant benefits to customers. And the Climate Action Plan backs this up. You can see here their comment on the importance of coordinating weatherization and fuel switching. So if the committee wanted to ensure that the clean heat standard delivers both greenhouse gas reductions and societal benefits, as well as customer cost savings, how might that be done? Um, the answer is by issuing annual clean heat standard credits based on lifetime emissions reductions. And I can explain a little bit more about that in the next couple of slides. This is just some data to show that the greenhouse gas emissions that different clean heat projects generate um, will vary. And so on this 
chart, you can see the longer the blue bar at the top, the greater the annual emissions reduction. So um, the largest uh, emission reduction that you see here on an annual basis is B100 biodiesel. Um, it provides the most benefits because it's 100% reduction, but it's a reduction that needs to happen again year after year after year. Um, and then at the bottom of the chart, you can see weatherization. Um, that doesn't look com very compelling in this annual analysis. Um, and that's because weatherization um, can you know, reduce a smaller you know, number of greenhouse gas emissions, but it reduces them for many, many years without an additional um, you know, intervention being needed every single year along the way. I should say in this analysis that you know, this doesn't presuppose the outcome of the technical advisory group that's being contemplated in the bill, um, but was really something Efficiency Vermont created based on the information that we have at our fingertips. Um, and based on the current bill's approach of awarding annual credits every year for the lifetime of a project, you can see in this table that the benefits of weatherization are undervalued, they're further down the chart, and instead, the current bill would most likely favor switching to biofuels, which don't produce those customer benefits, those customer cost reductions. As an alternative, if the bill were modified to issue the full lifetime credits for weatherization projects up front, weatherization could more easily compete with other clean heat standard options. So you can see in this chart, which looks at the lifetime benefits, um, weatherization benefits at the bottom of the chart are greater than fuel switching um, and more competitive, more in line with a heat pump water heater or other uh, options that are here on this chart. So in summary, Efficiency Vermont believes that the clean heat standard will be most valuable if it supports new weatherization projects. Um, as a reminder, I've testified before this committee that our thermal funding that Efficiency Vermont relies upon is declining due to changes in the forward capacity market. And so the clean heat standard could be an important source of weatherization funding going forward. And if the committee would like the clean heat standard to encourage weatherization projects and deliver both customer and societal benefits, we would recommend changing the bill text to award the full lifetime benefits of weatherization up front so that weatherization can compete with other clean heat standard options. And that's all I have to share with you today. I'm happy to take a few questions in the time that I have remaining. Okay. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, perennial question about you front load the, the benefits and in terms of assigning the, the lifetime credits in the year of implementation versus uh, facing them over time and so if you were to briefly say pros and cons I mean, I, well, how, how do you how do you analyze that and what led you to your conclusion I think, as I mentioned, the, the overarching frame that Efficiency Vermont is, is taking here is really from the customer perspective and, and encouraging the committee to ensure that the policies that you put in place to deliver societal benefits like greenhouse gas emissions reductions also deliver strong customer benefits like cost savings. So that's, you know, the, the overriding benefit is that a change like this would help to ensure that customer cost savings are factored in in a meaningful way and that weatherization is supported and, and promoted as part of this policy. Um, in terms of the, the cons to the policy, I'm aware that you know there this could cause some implications down the line in terms of um, you know the market for clean heat credits, and I, so I would encourage further study in terms of you know what a change like this would would do in terms of modeling how those credits come online and what the overall market you know looks like over the um, course of the the clean heat standard implementation, and that's something that I think the committee could look at as well as the tag. Sure. Um, thank you, and uh, head. Did you present this recommendation to the House before the bill was voted out? Or is this based on further studies since that happened a month ago? Yeah, this is new information. The, the analysis that I shared is something that Efficiency Vermont pulled together from our sources over the last week or so. Um, so it's new information that we did not provide into the House. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any committee questions for Ms. Foster? No, thank you. Oh, good. All right. Okay. Thank so, you. You, you only needed 12 minutes. <laughs> I appreciate that. I, I do appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. Thanks so much. We will follow up. Great. Okay. And with that, we will turn to the patient, Mr. Stephen Crowley. So if you could join us at the table and thank you for coming back. I know that we got started, but we 
we were up against the clock, and so uh, yes, you didn't have enough time to to get through your presentation. So let's we'll pick it back up again. Thank Great. You. Well, thank you. Thank you for making the time for you to come back and finish up. Uh, I uh, have uh, on, uh, on the thirty first when I was here, I shared a document that was uh, sort of um, uh, well, a few pages, but that was my written testimony. I also today put up some slides, which I uh, am not able to share with you on the screen right now, but uh, the slides, uh, I want to point you to those because uh, we have done quite a bit of thinking about different aspects of this bill, and we have a number of specific suggestions for changes in the law, and, and that's what's on the slides, so the eight or so pages of, of slides are each specific language changes we want to recommend. So, so when it comes time for you to go through and start looking at, at uh, the bill itself, uh, it would, it would uh, from our point of view, we would love to have you uh, give an eye towards what's in the slides because uh, there are a handful of changes that we recommend. Uh, just to, to back up a bit, I, I'll just start in, uh, just so committee members or anyone watching uh, knows that uh, Mr. Crowley's uh, slides are on the website today in the committee folder, and so uh, thanks for those. Um, the other quick question I have is there is a uh, informal working group that's been discussing different points of view on the bill, uh, trying to reconcile uh, a variety of perspectives. I'm just wondering if you have participated in that group, we're gonna be hearing from them tomorrow. And I don't know to what degree uh, your perspective is going to be included in that document or not. Well, you know, I have to say there are a number of informal working groups, and so I'm not sure which particular subset you're referring to. I certainly have uh, been involved in and pulled some working groups together with different organizations at, at different times, and I know that these things are very dynamic, so I'm, I can't say specifically if, okay. if my comments are reflect theirs, I think probably find that out tomorrow if, if their comments reflect mine, uh, but we have been you know, I looked at your witness list for tomorrow, and, and uh, you know, we have been in communication regularly with those folks, and uh, and uh, I, you know, I, uh, it, uh, we had one meeting last week, the second meeting, a uh, number of people had to bow out, so uh, we have been in discussion, but I can't tell you if I'm, if we're quite at the same place right now. Okay. Uh, so, uh, just a, a slight repeat, uh, the Sierra Club, whom I represent here, is uh, not opposing the bill. Uh, we're not quite ready to support it because we think that it needs some big fixes uh, to, to, to make sure that it doesn't do more harm than good. Uh, and that the biggest challenges we think are in the bioenergy area, biofuels. And I know that uh, Chairman Bergman mentioned that when he brought the bill to you, he said that that's one of the areas they didn't quite get to uh, and uh, urged you to look at it. So uh, I, you know, I think that there's, there is room for improvement. Uh, you know, just that overall bioenergy itself, uh, first of all, is not carbon neutral. We recognize it that way right now in our inventory process. It's not carbon neutral. It's a complicated uh, thing to look at, but it, it uh, uh, and some forms are better than others. Uh, the non greenhouse gas impacts are are what we're really uh, most concerned about, and and those are that as uh, as far as how well the bill covers that right now. Uh, these can be minimal at a small scale. But at a large scale, the non greenhouse gas impacts of bioenergy can be tremendous. And they already are. Uh, this is not new. We're not starting a whole new thing here. Uh, just for one example, right now, there are forests being devastated in the southeastern United States so the wood chips can get sent off to Europe uh, for electricity. And, and they're counting them as, as zero carbon, but we know they're not, and we know they're devastating forests. Uh, just yesterday, you may have noticed in the news that the IPCC came out with its 
third working group of the sixth assessment and on, on mitigation. Uh, and the, uh, the world's chief diplomat, you know, Secretary Guterres of the United Nations, uh, uh, was saying, we've got to stop lying to ourselves. And one of the very specific things that he was referring to was the approach to bioenergy. Uh, because we are fooling ourselves if we think we're really fixing things by, um, by ignoring the carbon impacts and the other impacts. Uh, different impacts. Uh, the solid fuels biomass uh, has forest impacts. The liquid fuels are often involved in a competition between agricultural land for food and agricultural land for energy. Uh, when, you know, repeatedly there have been uh, Food crises that have erupted because of the expansion of the use of land for, for fuel. Um, and we're, we're on a, a collision course with that. Um, uh, renewable natural gas uh, from landfills, from uh, large farms, uh, has um, issues about management and, and methane leaks, uh, local issues. So these can be enormous. There are uh, animal feeding operations that are super fun sites. So the local impacts can be really huge for those. Um, so we'd recommend three things with this. One is to change uh, the, add a section in the findings that recognizes this, this set of facts. Uh, and I've got some language in my slides. I won't go through it right now, but uh, language in the findings. Uh, there is a call in the section that asks that directs the, the technical advisory group what to do that describes its task and it describes one task is to look at sustainability of fuels and we think that this is one of those things that involves um, if you could go down a whole lot of different roads to find the answer to sustainability and so in you know if you look at our list and i won't go through it because it's a detailed list but but there are a lot of questions that should be asked and answered about what constitutes sustainability for, for solid fuels, for liquid fuels, for renewable natural gas. Uh, and, and uh, you know, to refer to the discussion you had with uh, Mr. Roizen earlier, um, I would say that these are more in line with policy decisions that should come from the legislature rather than leaving it a wide open an enormously wide open question for the PUC to answer. So that's in there. And then finally on bioenergy, uh, we recommend that you direct them, the Public Utility Commission, to uh, set limits on the non-greenhouse gas impacts so that there is, you know, it's not a fuzzy answer. I mean, it'll still be fuzzy, but, but to help clear things up, I think it's important to set them up. So let me move on from there. Well, maybe I should see if you have questions about that. Quick questions, because I know I don't want to take too much time. So, uh, the next question I want to address is getting the heat, the uh, clean heat balance right. And there are a couple of ways that this comes up. One is in terms of equity, and the other is in terms of the sources of clean heat credits. In terms of equity, uh, there is a carve out in the bill, as you, as you learned when you went through it, of 16% of the credits for, to go to low income Vermonters, 16% for moderate income Vermonters. Uh, and, and that's a great thing to, that's been included in this. Um, something that's important to point out about the, the biofuels in general is that they are uh, repeated expenses. You know, you never really get ahead with those. Uh, you're constantly needing to, you know, you actually have a dependence on those fuels. That's where all of these credits are going. We are very concerned that not enough of the credits will go towards things like weatherization and heat pumps that actually reduce your need for fuel. And this challenge, I think, you can imagine as being the greatest for low and moderate income demise. Uh, there's a tendency for them to remain dependent on those fuels when the investments are the option for them. So we recommend that uh, that those that 16 and 16 percent carve outs go towards things like whether say the tech side as opposed to the fuel side. 
the second element here is about uh, an overall balance in where these credits go. Uh, and we think it's really important to, to put a thumb on the scale and to emphasize investment in whether it's in tech, in weatherization, heat pumps, and so on, in fuel reducing technologies as opposed to. So we, we recommend a maximum of 25% credits overall going towards fuels. And, and the rest of the credits go towards um, uh, the tech side of the picture. Um, we have a couple of recommendations about specifying certain elements of the life cycle analysis that the tag will be well, I, yeah. Sorry, sort of catching up with this 25% maximum. It turns out, for whatever reason, a lot of people say, oh, well, the way I'm going to participate is to switch to uh, biofuel blends. And, um, and so there's substantial sales by um, fuel dealers of those products that, depending on how, what schedule the tag has developed, those credits will be created. So uh, I'm trying to figure out how it's this 25% cap works because what if you had if it turned out that the way Vermonters made their choices generated 50% fuel based credits and 50% coal mining pump and weatherization credits? Do you end up discounting or disallowing or mandatory banking of biofuel credits that would have been generated under the tag? Uh, well, I, I think that one answer is that there could be some uh, uh, moving of credits around. So, you know, if one person focuses more on the fuels and another on weatherization, that can work. I think it helps uh, to uh, to front load the weatherization credits as, you, as the recommendation that you just heard. Yeah. Uh, I think that helps a lot. Uh, uh, I think what it does is it, it uh, there's an economics question here. And the question is kind of, is this gonna to be totally market driven? Uh, or, or is it gonna be pushed in a certain way that may increase costs slightly? Uh, and, and so uh, I think that, uh, you know, if, if it's gonna cost a little more to go down the weatherization road, then that's appropriate as opposed to going down the continued dependence road. With, and in the background of all this is the knowledge that the fuel, the biofuel story involves lots of off-site, you know, non-greenhouse gas impacts. Uh, the greenhouse gases are really difficult to track to begin with. Some would say impossible. But they're they're not easy to get that life cycle accounting right. But the outside impacts, the non-greenhouse gas impacts, are a short thing. They're already happening. Um, if we keep it to a small scale, then it's manageable. If that expands, then then it becomes uh, then we become dependent on uh, joining in with the entire uh, country, continent, planet, who are shifting to these, you know, uh, theoretically low greenhouse gas fuels um, and the impacts become tremendous. So that's the, the rationale for trying to restrict the, you know, the, the focus to, to really uh, make the investment, you know, in, in those technologies that are going to make us more independent from the fuels in the first place. So the tag is going to be looking at uh, using the Greek method, you know, looking at fuels and assigning them um, values in terms of how much they contribute to greenhouse gases, right? And do you are you uh, confident in that method in terms of the depth and uh, sort of the quality of analysis that comes out of it? And, you know, and so an example of this would be if you're growing a biofuel, does it, uh, well, methane digesters, for instance, have come up as a source of renewable natural gas. 
but I'm not sure. I've asked the question. I haven't had a clear answer yet. Does that also? There's a renewable natural gas portion, but there's also the agri the cows and the agriculture behind creating the manure that went to the digester. And does it include the fuel costs of the tractors that went out to grow the crops that were harvested to feed the cows? Does it include cow-based methane, which um, is substantial? So do you know how far these analyses go? And are you satisfied with the depth of the analysis? Well, um, I think the analyses go very deep. I don't know if they capture every little piece. You do have a, a uh, clause in the law that specifically addresses that question yeah. about, you know, if you have an agricultural uh, sector project that produces energy sector results, how do you tease those out? And there is a section in your bill that addresses that specifically. Um, and it's an important question. Uh, you know, they, uh, cows do produce a lot of methane. Uh, but uh, most of the methane that they give off, you know, is not actually captured in a biodegradable, it's gaseous, you know, it, it's belches and farts and, and, and so it gets captured in the uh, digester is the manure, um, which would normally, I guess, in a, you know, if your cows are out in the pasture, they're going to, uh, you know, that, that's going to uh, decompose aerobically with oxygen, which means it goes right to carbon dioxide. It has to be in that anaerobic digester to produce methane. So what you're actually doing is creating a whole new situation with something that was not going to be producing as much methane. You're creating a whole new, you're not just capturing the methane that was going to be there anyway. You're missing most of that. You're, you're creating a whole new source of methane, which has its benefits. Right. It, it, uh, if you can capture it without leakage, which is a, a, an enormous problem in natural gas in general, then then uh, so that methane actually comes out pretty good on the scales. If you know if you if you manage it well, you avoid the leaks. Uh, it comes out pretty high on the well, I should say, you know, low greenhouse gas scale uh, among various biofuels. But I think in terms of sorting out, I think it's a big challenge to tease out what's ag and what's electrical. There is, a, that's already in the bill to, to address that. Uh, I know I'm probably running short on time here. So, uh, so a couple of, uh, things to bring up about the credit system. I think the credit system being brand new is, I don't know where to go with that. I think that it's a, it's a, it's a big deal to be setting up a whole new system like this. Um, one of the issues that comes up is banking of credits, uh, which is, is allowed in the bill. And it makes sense because it helps uh, manage the, the uh, economic bumps in the system. Uh, it can get out of hand. Uh, just to use an example, the Reggie program um, developed an enormous amount of bank credits, and that really suppressed uh, the market. It, it meant that the the uh, the cost of credits remained really really low, and and um, it didn't really produce the results that were intended until they had to go back and change that. So. We recommend that the uh, bank credits have a limit, um, and we put a few limits on it. We would say that uh, no party uh, should ever have more than 50% of a year's credits in the bank, that they can use no more than 10% of them in any given year, and that they expire in five years from the date of creation. Uh, and, and that way, um, uh, and and I'll, I think that I have a, an example that will show why that's especially important, and, and that is with the early action credit option. We're very concerned about this. Uh, partly it has to do with suppressing the market, and partly it has to do with who owns the credits. Um, so we, uh, we're concerned that, if, and, and you're familiar with the early action credit idea, that is that, that uh, starting a few months ago, 
people could uh, do projects and create credits by doing efficiency projects or selling biofuels. We don't have guidelines for those yet. We don't know what that means, but we're building up the credits. Uh, and then once the system starts, all those credits that are earned, created over the first couple of years would be available to use in the market as earned credits. So quite concerned about that because my feeling is that if you have all these built up credits over the years and suddenly flood the market with them, who's going to be doing actual projects at that point when you have to use up all your credits, uh, then you're going to suppress the market. So you spend a couple of years building your workforce, getting the system down, and then all of a sudden, instead of workforce using credits to do the work, and you stop making progress. Uh, so the early credits, I think, are uh, will be a hindrance to creating progress when they close the market later. Uh, unless unless the amount is bumped up somehow, or you know, that's compensated for somehow. Um, the second piece of that is the question of who owns the credits, and this is a, a big question. Uh, it's not entirely clear in the bill. Uh, I've had discussions with people where it kind of goes either way, uh, but there is a section of the bill that describes uh, how you can get credit from various, it says that, uh, let's see, just to remind you, it's 8124G in the bill, and it, and it says uh, that eligible, we need measures to be eligible for credit, to be retired, regardless of who creates or delivers them, and regardless of whether their creation or delivery is required by other states and programs. And then it goes on to say efficiency programs earn credits, public funding earns credits, uh, tier three earns credits. So we have concerns about this. Um, we're fine with counting weatherization program funding and other public funding, ARPA funding, as towards towards greenhouse gas reduction because that happens. That's just the physics of it. But we're concerned about who gets to own those credits, and I don't think it's clear. Uh, so if there's a ton of public funding going in, and you have providers of you know energy uh, efficiency outfits and and other providers doing that work. Well, who gets those credits? Can they go and sell them on the market? Are they sort of uh, capturing or in my like gas, the same token as an efficiency provider can earn credits or, or by selling renewable natural gas. Um, if they earn those credits, it's really on the public dime in the first place. Do they get to go and sell those credits? Are they kind of cashing? Is that a windfall for the private sector? Um, without really doing, without even, you know, without putting all of their skin in the game to earn those credits. So what we'd like to see is that uh, whoever put the money into the project owns the credits. Um, the provider might give them a discount and buy the credits that way, but it's not clear that's going to happen. So we would like to see it clarified about who owns the credits. Um, and related to that, we're particularly concerned about tier three. Um, you know, you had a discussion about tier three a couple of days ago. Uh, I think that's a great program. It's a real success in the renewable energy standard. Uh, that's required under the renewable energy standard. We don't think that it should also get credits counted towards greenhouse gas reduction because it's really happening. But uh, that would be sort of double dipping. Uh, if an electricity utility were to invest in uh, heat pumps, the big, which is, I think I saw in the chart, the biggest section, half of their tier three requirement is accomplished by heat pumps. Well, if they wanted to do more of that, then their tier three requirement, great, add that as, count that as uh, a credit under this bill, but don't allow double dipping. Uh, let's see. I guess we need to wrap up in the next two minutes. Okay, I can do that. I'm just about at the end. Uh, 
there are a couple of conflicts of interest that we would like to see addressed. Um, the default delivery agent right now can be a market participant, which is okay, but we're concerned that the default delivery agent is a uh, an obli one of the obligated parties, because that we feel is, would create unfair competition. And, and uh, I think you may hear more about this, but we would like to see that. Uh, they uh, ruled out and the other is we have some suggestions uh, for the makeup of the technical advisory group and again we feel that the obligated parties should not be part of the decision makers about their own regulations uh, we think they should be in the room but you know not at the table that they shouldn't be making those decisions so we recommend deleting obligated parties and the electric utilities from the list, uh, we've made a suggestion about some other uh, uh, expertise that should be on the tag, uh, but uh, uh, we recommend that those not be included. <clears throat> uh, you'll see in the next last page of my slides, uh, a recommendation for uh, consumer protection uh, disclosure and labeling. Uh, we want to recommend that with every transaction, the consumer uh, get uh, a page, a form, a label, more or less, that describes all the aspects of the sale, like what's happening to the credits, who owns the credits, how much are the credits worth in this transaction, which gives them the power to know what's happening. Gives them Mr. the Chair, power to act one question. way or another. Senator, who, would, who would do that work? The obligated party. Yeah, who, obligated. who would create the form? Yeah, or, or notify notify everyone. It would be, uh, I think it would be the actual, it would probably have to go, uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether it would be the retail okay. sales or the obligated party. I would think that it makes sense. Yeah. It seems to me it could be easily automated. You know, when, when my propane is delivered, I get a, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the tag uh, left in my door, uh, and that could very easily include the okay. Thank you for that, Sergeant Trevor. Um, so uh, that consumer protection labeling would be uh, a next last piece. And then finally, my last suggestion. Uh, with regard to renewable natural gas, there's a specific clause in Section 8124C that describes that the, uh, the obligated party uh, has secured a contractual pathway for the physical delivery of the gas. I'm, I'm not sure what that means. Does it mean that they have a certain volume that nobody else can use? Are they using the volume of the pipes that somebody else is also using at the same time? Uh, what I don't know what that means. Um, uh, it it uh, may be limiting, but to me it sounds like a statement without meaning. It, does, it doesn't really mean anything in the physical world. It seems like a, a linguistic curiosity, not a actual thing. Say it again. The, the language is the obligated party, it's only Vermont gas, um, would demonstrate that it has secured a contractual pathway for the physical delivery of the gas from the point of injection into the pipeline to the obligated party's delivery system. And the idea of this is that we're saying that this isn't about offsets, this is about actual changes that happen. And these things are connected to us. And I'm not sure that that really does anything. Uh, it may mean that all the pipes are connected. So we might, we might, you know, have might be directly from the uh, gas fields of Alberta to Vermont. Um, but I, we would suggest, and I don't know what to do about that, but we would suggest language that says, and the physical source of gas is transparently available for third party verification of sustainable practices absence of harmful impact to communities and absence of double counting for greenhouse gas or any other attributes. So one of the things that that obscure language 
could lead to is that you don't really know where it's coming from. Uh, you really can't. And how do you know that any of this is really accurate? So, so we recommend adding that language that allows for transparency and verification. Thank you. So Thank you. that's it. And, and if there are right. any questions, I'm happy to. Okay. For the issues you were raising, do you have suggested edits in mind or? I do. Okay. And that those they are all in the in, slides. In, okay. I started to listen and I took listen and right. So, right. Yeah. Well, I was gonna have it up on the screen, but I don't think that would have helped either. Yeah, right. So it's good listening. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Mr. Chairman, I need my note back. It has a phone number on it, I need. Okay. Thank you. All right. With that, we're gonna turn to um Korean Wynn who's joining us from Oregon. Good morning. Oregon. Okay. Sorry that we're uh, we're hours ahead of you. So we've rousted you out earlier in the day than uh, you were expecting. But thanks for making that adjustment and jumping in. Um, you're, I think you provided testimony when this bill, H715, was in the House. Um, and now it's you're speaking to Senate Natural Resources Energy. So um, uh, if you, I think if you could share your sort of, we have questions, but if, if I'd like to start with hearing from you on the bill in terms of the kind of testimony you've already shared with the House. Thanks so much. Okay, yeah. And, so and, and sorry, one last thing. We have about 15 minutes just so that you'll have a sense of timing. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm so sorry for the mix up this morning. Yeah, I'm in Pacific time. Um, for the record, so, so my name is Corianne Wind. Um, I work for the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality and I am the program manager for the Oregon Clean Fuels Program. So for Oregon, that means it's a low carbon fuel standard that applies to our transportation fuels. But my understanding is that uh, largely the framework that you're trying to achieve with this clean heating standard is very um, similar. It's basically off the same framework. And so what I want to provide today is just some background on how we implement the Oregon Clean Fuels Program. And like you said, be available, available for any questions um, that you might have. Uh, so you. you've got the slides. Yes, we have them on our website. Thank you. Do you want to have those slides up I can screen share. to talk about them? Or do you want to, sometimes we, sometimes presenters want their slides up, sometimes they're just talking. So which way do you want to do this? Um, yeah, no, I, I'll, I'll talk for a minute. If you have the slides, I'll just let you know which slides that I'm on. Um, <laughs> we have a screen share. Do oh, you, you want me to? Do you, you want me to screen share? Yeah. Yeah, let's do screen share. That way we'll all be on the same page, literally. Thank you. Okay. Great. Okay, got it? Yes, thank you. Okay, awesome. So I think I need to go back one slide. So there we go. So, um, so here is basically in a nutshell is how we run our clean fuels program. We began our program in 2016. Um, and what it requires is um, importers of gas and diesel in the state of or to the state of Oregon to basically lower their carbon intensity or their um, life cycle greenhouse gas emissions um, to Oregon. And so um, it uh, requires a 10% reduction um, of emissions over a 10 year period. So we began in 2016 um, with a small reductions and then annually it gets more aggressive. So now we're in 2022 and we're requiring a 5% reduction some, from our baseline of 2015. Um, our current program goes out to 2025 with a 10% reduction. But what we're working on right now in a rulemaking um, process is to extend those targets out to 2035, largely driven by an executive order from our governor, Kate Brown, 
to achieve a minimum of 25% reductions in 2035. Um, last week, we had a robot making advisory committee and our initial proposal is to achieve 37% uh, carbon intensity reductions out to 2035. So, um, the program has been working for the first five years of the program. And basically this is a signal that we just wanna be more aggressive and achieve more reductions from this program. And how are you doing so far? Yep. Of- yep, so far what we're, this is a, a slide that Tate, um, excuse me. Um, I, I need to, here we go. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so to date, uh, the program has resulted in over six and a half million tons of greenhouse gas reductions. That is life cycle emissions. Um, it supported the displacement over a billion gallons of gas and diesel to the state of Oregon. Um, that, um, largely, that is due to blending of biofuels, ethanol, biodiesel, renewable diesel. And those fuels are getting cleaner itself because not all of the biofuels are created equal. Um, they do have um, the ones that are made from waste base are cleaner than the ones that are made from crop base, feedstocks and, and those kinds of things. So those are getting cleaner as well. Um, and then the amount that we're using is actually increased. And so we, um, as a baseline, we have um, a 10% ethanol blend with our gasoline and we uh, have a 5% biodiesel blending with diesel. Um, and that's our baseline. But to date, we're probably up in a 13%, 14% range. Uh, we've had quarters when we've uh, reported over 15%. So just an increase in the over amount of biofuels that we're using, um, as well as a stark, a very steep increase in the amount of electricity that we're using um, into um, electric vehicles that are in the state. And that's not only light duty vehicles, that is also um, medium and heavy duty vehicles, as well as off-road vehicles as well. Okay. Okay, Thank you. One of the things that I wanted to cover here was just this, the nature of the biofuels. I know there's a lot of confusion about, well, ethanol is ethanol, biodiesel is biodiesel, and that's really not the case. Because we use a life cycle approach to assess what those carbon emissions are, it really does start from how that um, feedstock is produced. So, and all the way through going to a biorefinery, how it's transported, how it gets into the state, as well as how it's combusted in a vehicle. And it's the aggregate of all of those emissions that dictate what a fuel's carbon score is. So for example, if you have a biodiesel and it's made from soybean or canola, right? It's a crop base and we would consider like how that crop is grown and then refined. Um, As opposed to something like a used cooking oil, biodiesel that is also very common. It's a waste, right? It's, it comes out of a French fry uh, grease um, and then it's processed and used in a vehicle. And so the emissions for something like a soybean, you know, is higher than what the emissions would be out of a, a used cooking oil. So this just, I mean, it's, it's a weedy um, slide, but it basically represents the different models and how we go about assessing what those carbon emissions are. Um, it's, we use a model called GREET, which is developed by the Argonne National Laboratory. Um, and so it is, um, it is the, the accepted model in the US to calculate the emissions. Um, It is the same model that um, the California uses in their low carbon fuel standard. And so, um, you know, so then a facility that is making a biofuel basically comes to the state and says, this is how I make my fuel. And we um, approve a carbon score that is associated with it. So for example, like this soybean biodiesel, it probably has a carbon score of about somewhere in the range of like 45, 50, 55 grams of carbon dioxide equivalents per megajoule. That's the, uh, the unit that we use. Um, but for something like a used cooking oil, it's probably more like 20, right? So we value the lowest of the low uh, carbon fuels. And how is it on the very bottom line that the factor for corn 
is so different under the California model versus the Oregon model. I suppose the absolute number doesn't matter if you um, adjust things using the same system. I mean, if things compete in the same system, you get consistent results, but I'm trying to understand how they could be so different. Right. One of, one of the difficulties in doing these life cycle models is, is to assess what this indirect land use changes. So if you grow, if you have more demand for a crop-based biofuel, will that cause farmers to plant more acreage to displace something like a rainforest to be more cropland? And so it's trying to quantify what that effect that is very difficult. So the difference between Oregon and California for this particular model is we use different models. So uh, this GTAP model is developed by Purdue. We use the C-Club model and it's Purdue, um, developed by Argonne. And so that's why there's different numbers. So you add this on top of whatever carbon score that the Greek model gives you. So like you said, if they're all competing within Oregon, all of the corn-based ethanol facilities get this 7.6. Um, all of the corn-based ethanol in California gets this 19.8. So within the state, they compete on a, a level playing field. But if somebody is deciding whether to come to Oregon versus come to California, then that we, get, we give them that lower number. So it does, um, it does improve their, um, um, you know, basically the value of that product coming to Oregon. Um, but there's a lot of different factors that play into that, mostly logistics and transportation and how you're going to get the fuel from, you know, say the Midwest um, um, to the West Coast. Thank you. Okay, so this next slide here is just a snapshot of the credit market that we run for the clean fuels program. So this is a market that we've set up that basically allows parties within the program to trade credits amongst themselves. So credits in this program represent a ton of greenhouse gas emissions. They are not paper credits. They get issued after the, the fuels are actually um, distributed into Oregon and put into a vehicle. And only then do the credits uh, are generated. You get more credits, the lower carbon your fuel is. So in that example of that biodiesel, you get uh, you get a number of credits for the soy because it's lower than regular diesel, but you get more credits from the used cooking oil because it's way lower. Um, and so what the credits do is that the entities that bring in the higher carbon fuels, like um, people that bring in um, gas and diesel, they have to lower their carbon intensity. They can blend in biofuels themselves. They can invest in electric uh, vehicle chargers or renewable natural gas project or they can buy credits from entities that provide them. And so this is a chart from basically the beginning of our program. Um, on a monthly basis, we publish what those credit prices are so that we have transparency in the market as far as the value of those credits. So those credits are worth about $125 per ton of carbon um, in, the, in Oregon. And you can see by that orange line, it's been, it's been pretty flat in the past year. Um, it has peaked as high as 162-ish, I think, um, but it's pretty steady at about 125 now. And in comparison, in California, I want to say the credit prices are about $120 now, which is pretty unusual because they've been as high as $200. California is five years ahead of us, and so the market is more mature and they require more reductions. So you would expect that because they're further along in, the, in their program that they're um, credits would be worth more. Um, but they are also getting to the end of their program and they are trying to go through rulemaking to adjust as well. Um, but what I wanted to point out here is that it's the credit prices is the way that we determine like how much value or cost there is to a gallon of fuel for the state of Oregon. And so what the legislature requires me to do is on an annual basis is take these average credit prices and translate them into the cost of complying with the program. And so there's, a, a, there's an equation that's actually in a bill that basically reflects if an oil company had to buy all of their credits from the market, as opposed to blending themselves or investing themselves. So this is the 
is the highest cost way of complying. Um, but if they had to buy all of their um, obligations on the open market in 2021, that resulted in about a five cent per gallon for a, a gallon of gas and about a 5.8 cents per gallon for a gallon of diesel. But what that also means is for the lower carbon fuels, the, the amount of credits that you generate by delivering that fuel into Oregon, you get those credits, you sell those credits, and it's the revenue from those credits that basically offset the cost of the lower carbon fuels. So for example, if you're blending in corn ethanol with gasoline, and an average corn ethanol is about 55 grams of CO2, you're generating about 39 cents per gallon, right? For that corn ethanol and revenue from selling those credits. Ethanol is already cheaper than gasoline. And so what this does is that it brings down the cost of that E10 gallon to people that are using gasoline. That also creates incentives for you to use higher blends of ethanol. So that's like the, the cost of the five cents per gallon is for an E10. So for example, you wanna do an E15. Uh, which many cars can take now, or E85 for flex fuel vehicles. You can see as the, the amount of ethanol goes up, it's the price impact on that gallon comes down. So it's, that's where the cost savings are. Similarly, with these next um, examples of the biodiesel, you start with a B5 blend of biodiesel, but biodiesel, as you well know, you can have much higher blends of biodiesel. You can have B10, B20, B50, B99. And so the more and more that you use of that, the, the price of that gallon comes down. We have a used cooking oil biodiesel facility in, in Oregon um, and their carbon intensity is about 20, right? So for every gallon that they're delivering into the state, there's revenue associated at a dollar and 16 per gallon. So that significantly brings down that cost of that B5. And if you're talking about things like like our truck stops very often now actually carry B20 as a standard blend because the cost of B20 to a trucker is actually cheaper than a gallon of B5. Um, here also I have some examples of electricity used in vehicles. Um, you know, like this 15 cents per kilowatt for Oregon. Um, you can get wholesale uh, electricity in Oregon for about three to five cents per kilowatt. And so if you have electric chargers that are, you know, that are charging electric buses, for example, you're actually making money off the credits that are associated with it. So you can use that extra revenue to like pay off a charger, pay off another bus and, and what have you. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to kind of give you some examples um, of this about how um, there might be this impact to the gallon of the fossil fuels that we're using, but what it really does is incent, you know, the transition to more of the lower carbon fuels. Okay, thank you. And actually that's my last slide. So if you have any questions, um, I'd be happy to take them or. Uh, sure, Senator McCormick. Thanks. Uh, there are those who, who say, who, who dislike the whole idea of biofuels that, first of all, they may be lower carbon than fossil fuels, but they're still carbon. And the second big complaint I hear is that it, it puts energy production in competition with food production. Would you comment on both of those? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm sorry, I have a cough this morning I woke up with. Um, so I, I'll start with your second one. Uh, with the second one, you know what, if you look at um, especially acreage in the United States for the past 20 years of biofuels policy, what you actually see is that there's no actually um, increase in the amount of acreage that is being planted for something like soybean or, or corn. Um, the farmers have been very good at increasing yields and not increasing the acreage that they're farming. And then being really, really good about pulling every single last piece of like 
good stuff out of a koi bean or a corn kernel. They're using all of the fiber, they're using the sugars, they're making ethanol, they're making animal feed, they're making human food. And um, I think what you're seeing now is that even though there is this increased demand for biofuels, um, it's still not an increase in, in acreage. And so I think that's a good indicator of that. Um, and I do understand, you know, the, the, the kind of like the competition uh, between just the energy systems um, you know, for, for, for the way that we do the clean fuels program, because it is transportation emissions, it is the largest sector of greenhouse gas emissions in the state of Oregon, and we need to reduce those emissions. Um, we do have very aggressive um, electrification and zero emission technology goals in Oregon as well, but we know that that's not going to happen overnight. Um, so with the electric vehicles or with fuel cells. And so, you know, as we transition to that, we're gonna to need to do something now. And liquid biofuels in the form of ethanol and biodiesel and renewable diesel are something that's available like immediately in like commercial quantities, lower carbon, tailpipe emissions are reduced, they're public health benefits. And so for all of these reasons, you know, there, there is a place uh, for the biofuels at this time and even when, like, you know, there are some people that think that everything is going to electrify, I'm, I honestly think that there's going to be some applications that will never um, electrify. And so I think there's always going to be a place for liquid biofuels. And we need to set up a system to make sure that we continually incent th th those liquid biofuels to get lower carbon as well. Thank you very much. Um, well, I, I don't see any other committee questions. Thanks for coming. I, well, I have one quick one. Sorry, I uh, wrote it down early. How long did it take from a bill passing to standing up the functional program? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so our original bill was passed by our legislature in 2009. Um, we had a year long uh, stakeholder process to develop the, the rule. Um, but what happened is that we actually ended up not moving forward with implementing the rule at the time. Um, economically, it was during a recession. And so we did a lot more stakeholder involvement. We worked with um, California and British Columbia who were implementing at that time, just learning more and reaching out to our stakeholders to really kind of focus in on what we were trying to do and implement lessons learned from what the other jurisdictions were going to. So that's why we didn't move forward um, with the um, with the program until 2016. Um, we were uh, ready to implement after a year of, of of working with our stakeholders, and I know that's basically the timeline that the state of Washington is on right now, um, having about a year to stand up the rulemaking and the systems it takes to implement this um, to the time where it actually um, begins. Okay. Well, again, thanks very much, and we appreciate you joining us bright and early Oregon time. <laughs> yeah, thank you for having me. Okay, thank you. Um, that I'd like to turn to uh, Ms. Smith, uh, who... Yeah, stop the screen share. A little screen thing fixed here, and then we'll be all set. So, uh, good morning, Miss Smith. So, good morning. We are we're starting under the gun time. So, let me just say, why don't we get started? And if you're interested, we'll schedule time to continue. Uh, or if you feel like it's too disruptive to do that this way, we'll just reschedule you entirely and with apologies that um, testimony ran a little long prior to you. And so would you rather just start without uh, another time and rather than have to start and stop? Your choice. Well, I'm, I've been grappling with that question myself. I'm, I'm sorry to say that the, I'm kind of expect to get seven to nine minutes in your committee. I have more than that. Pre prepared. I can start 
I, I guess I would appreciate if you're going to have a hard stop at noon, that if I could continue, I don't know, I could do it tomorrow morning. I do have some conflicts the rest of this week, but. Okay. So um, that fire in your shoes, I, I think rather than start and stop, which yeah. is awkward, um, let's find a time that works for, for you and the committee and we'll just reschedule. So that well, I, I noticed that you're taking testimony tomorrow morning on this. Is that right? Uh, yeah, we're, although I think I'll have to look. We, we've we modified that. I don't know if it's posted yet, but while we've been meeting, the agenda for tomorrow morning has been getting updated. So uh, let me look again and see what, what would work. Uh, I, I could come in tomorrow morning. I have no time uh, tomorrow afternoon, or you don't meet in the afternoon. I have no time yeah. Thursday morning or Friday morning. So tomorrow okay. morning. What is the uh, rescheduling tomorrow? What is that about? So we have, uh, I'll, I'll just read the list for people who are interested. Tomorrow morning, when we pick this back up, we have scheduled Jared Duval, Ben Walsh, Chase Whiting, Dylan Zwicky, Vanessa Rule, Beverly Little Thunder, and Judy Dow. Uh, and I'm not, so I'm just concerned that we yeah. don't end up in the same place again with a robust list and run out of time. You didn't mention affiliations. I, I had asked. Those are all three. Those are three fifty uh, suggestions. I, I will note, since I've been attending some of the 350 Vermont meetings, that they had asked specifically for a presentation by Scott Zenz. I think that's his name. And I'd, I'd recommend you hear it. It's a very good presentation. I, I will point out that I, as usual, have a, a different perspective than a lot of people. And so I really would like to have adequate time to be here. Okay. So we might have a little. OK, thank you. OK, um, so I'll work with you and June directly. We'll find a time. And uh, yeah, there's a caucus at noon. So we are going to have a hard stop. And I don't want everyone having to rush off or someone leaving the committee for that meeting. So with that, it's 5 of 12. And um, 